Although copyright owners can often trace infringement of copyrighted material to an IP address, it is not always easy to pinpoint the particular individual or device engaged in the infringement, but that connection does not mean that the internet subscriber is also the infringer. So this is a order for publication, which means this is precedent or can be precedential. United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in Cobbler, Nevada versus Thomas Gonzalez. This is one of the cases that I, that I handle this kind of case. So this could be considered attorney advertising. Fair, fair warning there. Um, this is a case where a movie studio has sued a defendant claiming that they downloaded something from the internet using a file sharing network, probably, probably BitTorrent. I haven't seen Mr. Gonzalez's actual complaint from Cobbler, Nevada. So I'm going to assume that it's BitTorrent based file sharing because that's the one everybody's doing these days. The panel, the, the, the appeals court, affirmed the district court's dismissal of an action under the Copyright Act alleging direct and contributory infringement of plaintiff's copyrights in a film. Plaintiff alleged unauthorized downloading and, distribu and distribution of the film through peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent networks. The panel held that the bare allegation that the defendant was the registered subscriber of an internet protocol address associated with infringing activity was insufficient to state a claim for direct or contributory infringement. The panel also held that the district court did not abuse its discretion in awarding attorney's fees. In this copyright action, we consider whether a bare allegation that a defendant is a registered subscriber of an IP address associated with infringing activity is sufficient to state a claim for direct or contributory infringement. We conclude that it is not. After tracing infringement of its copyrights to a particular IP address, Cobbler, Nevada, I believe Cobbler is The Cobbler, Adam Sandler's The Cobbler, I think is the movie we're talking about here, filed suit against the John Doe IP address for direct and contributory copyright infringement. Cobbler Nevada soon discovered that the IP address was registered to Thomas Gonzalez, who operated an adult foster care home. Cobbler Nevada then amended its complaint to name Gonzalez as the sole defendant, alleging that he directly infringed by copying and distributing copyrighted works himself, or, in the alternative, contributed to another's infringement by failing to secure his internet connection. The district court properly dismissed Cobbler Nevada's claims. The, the direct infringement claim fails because Gonzalez's status as the registered subscriber of an infringing IP address standing alone does not create a reasonable inference that he is also the infringer. Because multiple devices and individuals may be able to connect via an IP address, simply identifying the IP subscriber solves only part of the puzzle. A plaintiff must allege something more to create a reasonable inference that a subscriber is also an infringer. Nor can Cobbler Nevada succeed on a contributory infringement theory because, without allegations of intentional encouragement or inducement of infringement, an individual's failure to take affirmative steps to police his internet connection is insufficient to state a claim. Now, we knew this. We knew this uh, a long time ago. These were arguments that I have made in court many times before. Unfortunately, they don't always convince judges that the case shouldn't proceed forward. So I'm, right now, I'm reading this for when the court allows a case to proceed forward and when we can cut a case off. Because if I can cite this case and file motions to dismiss in all of my cases, I need to be able to bring this to my clients and say, hey, you've got an option here. A judge finally agreed with us that an IP address is not a person and maybe this applies to other cases. So who knows what's going to happen from here. Cobbler Nevada holds copyrights in the film The Cobbler, a magic realism film that features a cobbler bored of his everyday life who stumbles upon a magical heirloom that allows him to become other people. Like a number of major motion pictures scheduled for theatrical release, The Cobbler has been subject to unauthorized downloading and distribution, pirating, through BitTorrent networks. According to Cobbler Nevada, there have been over 10,000 instances of infringing activity of the Cobbler traced to Oregon alone. Cobbler Nevada identified an IP address located in Portland, Oregon that had downloaded and distributed the Cobbler multiple times without authorization. Cobbler Nevada filed suit against the unknown holder of the IP address for direct and contributory copyright infringement. 
Records subpoenaed from Comcast identified Thomas Gonzalez as a subscriber. After several attempts to reach Gonzalez, Cobbler's counsel finally connected via telephone. Once counsel learned that the internet service was accessible to both residents and visitors at an adult care home, he concluded that it does not appear that Gonzalez is a regular occupant of the residence or the likely infringer. Due to confidentiality concerns, Gonzalez refused to share the names or work schedules of the individuals living and working in the home without a court order. Although the district court granted leave to depose Gonzalez, the deposition revealed no new information regarding the identity of the actual infringer. During deposition, Gonzalez testified that, once he became aware of the infringing activity, he attempted to find out who the infringer was and instructed everyone to stop infringing. He also testified that his staff took the same steps, but no one was able to identify the infringer. Nevertheless, Cobbler Nevada filed a first amended complaint naming Gonzalez as the defendant. Cobbler Nevada alleged that Gonzalez copied and distributed the Cobbler or, in the alternative, facilitated and promoted the use of the internet for the infringing of Cobbler Nevada's exclusive rights under the Copyright Act by failing to reasonably secure, police, and protect the use of his internet service. Cobbler Nevada also claimed that Gonzalez had been sent over 400 notices of infringing activity, yet failed and refused to take any action whatsoever, and either continued to infringe by using BitTorrent to download, uh, or continued to allow infringing activity after such notices. The only facts in support of Cobbler Nevada's direct infringement claim were that Gonzalez was the subscriber of the IP address used to download or distribute the movie, and that he was sent notices of infringing activity to which he did not respond. Relying on the magistrate judge's reasoning that these allegations were not enough to state a claim because there were no facts connecting Gonzalez to the infringing activity, the district court dismissed the direct infringement claim without prejudice. The district court also dismissed the contributory infringement claim which rested on the theory that Gonzalez failed to stop infringement by others after being notified of such infringement. The court wrote that liability arises by actively encouraging infringement through specific acts and not by mere failure to take affirmative steps to police or prevent infringement. Cobbler Nevada's failure to allege that Gonzalez promoted, encouraged, enticed, persuaded, or induced another to infringe any copyright, let alone Cobbler Nevada's copyright, sunk the claim. The district court gave Cobbler Nevada three weeks to file an amended complaint. Instead of amending its claims, they filed a second amended complaint in which, once again, they tried to name the Doe IP address as the sole defendant, the John Doe anonymous IP address. No new factual allegations were added. The magistrate judge ordered Cobbler Nevada to show cause why the second amended complaint should not be dismissed for failure to cure the deficiencies identified in the court's dismissal of the first amended complaint or for failure to identify the unknown party in a timely manner, according to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 4M. Less than a week later, Cobbler Nevada filed a notice of voluntary dismissal. So they attempted to dismiss the case and get out. Gonzalez then filed a motion requesting entry of judgment, dismissing the case, and for attorney's fees for the contributory infringement claim. The district court granted the motion and awarded Gonzalez attorney's fees of $17,222.40 and costs of $252.20. Analysis. The district court properly dismissed Calber Nevada's direct infringement claim without prejudice. Although copyright owners can often trace infringement of copyrighted material to an IP address, it is not always easy to pinpoint the particular individual or device engaged in the infringement. Internet providers such as Comcast and AT&T can go so far as to identify the individual who is registered to a particular IP address, the account holder or subscriber, and the physical address associated with the account, but that connection does not mean that the internet subscriber is also the infringer. The reasons are obvious. Simply establishing an account does not mean a subscriber is even accessing the internet, and multiple devices can access the internet under the same IP address. Identifying an infringer becomes even more difficult in instances like this one, where numerous people live in and visit a facility that uses the same internet service. While we recognize this obstacle to naming the correct defendant, this complication does not change the plaintiff's burden to plead factual allegations that create a reasonable inference that the defendant is the infringer. The only connection between Gonzalez and the infringement was that he was the registered internet subscriber and that he was sent infringement notices. To establish a claim of copyright infringement, Cobbler Nevada must show that it owns the copyright and that it the defendant himself violated one or more of the plaintiff's exclusive rights under the Copyright Act. Cobbler Nevada has not done so. This is a situation where a complaint pleads facts that are merely consistent with a defendant's liability, stopping short of the line between possibility and plausibility of entitlement to relief. 
the allegations are not enough to raise a right to relief above the speculative level. This result should come as no surprise to Calder Nevada, which acknowledged that its independent investigation did not permit identification of a specific party that is likely to be the infringer. Nor did the district court err in entering judgment in favor of Gonzalez after Calder Nevada voluntarily dismissed its second amended complaint. Once the claims against Gonzalez were dismissed, Calber Nevada failed to cure the deficiencies and instead amended its complaint to name the DOE IP address once again as the sole defendant. This put things right back where they started, naming an IP address without identifying an actual infringer. Recognizing that the claims against Gonzalez were not resolved, the district court entered judgments reflecting its earlier dismissal of Calber Nevada's direct infringement claim without prejudice and the contributory infringement claim with prejudice. Calber Nevada argues the district court should have granted it further leave to amend before entering judgment, which had the effect of foreclosing any further amendment. In light of Calber Nevada's prior amendments to the complaint and the futility of any further amendment, the district court acted within its discretion in not granting further leave to amend. The district court properly dismissed Calber Nevada's contributory infringement claim with prejudice. With prejudice means the case and claims cannot be filed again. So that's what you want when you're a defendant in one of these things. You want the thing dismissed with prejudice. It means it's been adjudicated, it's done, and it cannot be filed or prosecuted again. We have adopted the well-settled rule that one infringes contributorily by intentionally inducing or encouraging direct infringement. Liability exists if the defendant engages in personal conduct that encourages or assists the infringement. A claim for contributory infringement requires allegations that the defendant is one who, with knowledge of the infringing activity, induces, causes, or materially contributes to the infringing conduct of another. Calder Nevada's contributory infringement claim is premised on a bare allegation that Gonzalez failed to police his internet service. This perfunctory allegation without more does not sufficiently link Gonzalez to the, infra to the alleged infringement. At the outset, we recognize that Gonzalez's position, a subscriber to internet service, does not fit cleanly within our typical contributory liability framework, which often involves consumer-facing internet platforms such as Grokster and Amazon. Nevertheless, it, it is no leap to apply the framework of similar technology-based cases to our analysis of Gonzalez's liability. In Sony v. Universal, the Supreme Court held that liability for another's infringement cannot arise from the mere distribution of a product that is widely used for legitimate, non-infringing purposes. The court later refined that standard for liability, holding that one who distributes a device with the object of promoting its use to infringe copyright, as shown by clear expression or other affirmative steps taken to foster infringement, is liable for the resulting acts of infringement by third parties. See Grokster. In essence, the limitation of liability in Sony, premised on a refusal to impute intent of a defendant based solely on knowledge that a product might be used for infringement, does not apply where evidence shows statements or actions directed to promoting infringement. The court was clear, however, that in the absence of such evidence of intent, a court would be unable to find contributory infringement liability merely based on a failure to take affirmative steps to prevent infringement if the device otherwise was capable of substantial non-infringing uses. Mere knowledge of infringement or the infringing potential uh, would not be enough here to subject a distributor to liability. Although circuit courts approach contributory liability through varying lenses, our circuit has identified two strands of liability following Sony and Grokster, actively encouraging or inducing infringement through specific acts or distributing a product distributees use to infringe copyrights if the product is not capable of substantial or commercially significant non-infringing uses, we analyze contributory liability in light of rules of fault-based liability derived from the common law and common law principles established that intent may be imputed. Turning to the first strand, Cobbler Nevada's complaint lacks any allegations that Gonzalez actively encouraged infringement through specific acts. Nothing in Calber Nevada's complaint alleges or even suggests that Gonzalez actively induced or materially con uh, contributed to the infringement through purposeful, culpable expression and conduct. No allegations suggest that Gonzalez made any clear expression or took affirmative steps to foster the infringement. Gonzalez's only action was his failure to secure police or protect the connection. Nor does the second strand implicate Gonzalez. Providing internet access can hardly be said to be distributing a product or service that is not capable of substantial or commercially significant non-infringing uses. 
We note that Calder Nevada's theory both strays from precedent and effectively creates an affirmative duty for private internet subscribers to actively monitor their internet service for infringement. Imposing such a duty would put at risk any purchaser of internet service who shares access with a family member or roommate who is not technologically savvy enough to secure the connection to block access by a frugal neighbor. This situation hardly seems to be one of the circumstances in which it is just to hold one individual accountable for the actions of another. They go on to say that it was not an abuse of discretion to award attorney's fees. We'll skip this part. On the whole, the district court considered the facts of this case, weighed the appropriate factors, and made a fee determination based on the conduct of the parties. And they just unceremoniously end with an affirmation. They explain themselves. There's no conclusion. Affirmed. So that's very interesting, and yours truly is going to have to look into how much I can apply that to my cases. We've known this sort of thing for a while, and a lot of these cases don't necessarily fall under this kind of thing, because to get here, Gonzalez did go through a deposition. He was subject to a search to at a, at a certain cursory level to see if they could identify the infringing party. So many of my clients don't even want to go that far into a case, and they need representation just to help them figure out whether that's the appropriate way to go. It's nice that we'll be able to encourage my clients and defendants to fight these cases more using these kinds of things, but that doesn't necessarily change that many people don't even want to be subject to a deposition or have to appear in court. So a lot of these cases, the copyright troll gets what they want because the the defendant is unable or unwilling for one reason or the other, and I'm not judging, because when you are a defendant in one of these things, it's a lot different when you're facing the liability than when you're sitting on the outside looking in. It's a whole lot different when you're playing on the field, when you're the one who has to carry the ball, than when you're watching someone do it. When you have to carry the ball, suddenly you realize that you really have to look out for yourself you, you can't really carry the ball for the cause unless they just happen to coincidentally line up. Because if you carry the ball for the cause, you might do severe damage to yourself if you lost or, or even if you win. So you have to carry the ball for yourself. And so the, the phrase or the, the saying is, I fight for clients, not causes. I do like to talk about causes, but fighting for clients is what us lawyers have to do. So I don't judge anyone who's found themselves in, one, in, in this kind of position with this kind of lawsuit and they haven't been able to decide whether they wanna settle their case or fight their case, or they feel bad that they're, they can't fight their case and they want to, they want to pay money or something. Um, this, uh, this is a terrible situation these cases put people in because it's just an internet connection. How could I get in trouble for it is, is what I hear a lot. And let's not forget that there was $17,000 in lawyer's fees before that that ended. And so, yes, you can ask the opposing party for lawyer's fees, but you have to pay your lawyer first. Right. You don't get that $17,000 for nothing. You had to pay that out. You, the defendant, paid your attorney. And actually, for what this attorney did for Mr. Gonzalez, that's a bargain, Kudos to the attorney who was able to write to 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 do that level of work at to to, to write these motions to dismiss and defend them and bring them to the uh, court of appeals for the Ninth Circuit and only charge your client seventeen thousand dollars. I'm pretty sure that a bill could very easily have been higher than that, and depending upon. Um, if the, what the bill was for the appeal, it might be higher than that. We don't know. But that's, that's a very, very small amount of money. And so when, when defendants are considering defending these cases, they're thinking about that amount of money. Do I have $17,000 to defend the case? What if the plaintiff is offering settlement for something much lower? That's, that's a hard one for a lot of people to decide. My dog. Where's my dog? Were you asleep, honey? 
Yes, he was asleep. He looks a little, he looks a little rough. It's that time. It's that time. See, he does. He's a little groggy. Does he look a little groggy? His eyes are a little bit slow to respond. He's just a little groggy. I just, I just woke him up to come say hi to this stream. All right, so that is a that is our show, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am, of course, Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is a community-supported channel. Thank you very much to all of our Patreon supporters for supporting us and our efforts to educate the lawful masses. In September now, we have new $50 plus supporters. Thank you very much to Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mantain, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Grunkle Tia Marie, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, and Michael Jones. Richard, let me know if I've mispronounced your name, if it's Fournier or Fournier or something else, and I'll make sure to correct that. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the LED panel behind me, and I I will find a place for you on the crawl as well. All right, that's our show, everyone. Have a good week, a good Labor Day holiday, and I will see you in the videos that drop. Love you all. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you for all the bit donations. Blighted Tail on wins with the 160 bits. Have a great week.